and there we go. Yes. Hello, David. Wonderful. We do have internet. It seems to be working quite stably, which is nice. Hello. Tonight is Robin's, the bird. That's what we're going to draw. And then maybe the um, sidekick. But we'll see. We'll see where we get. Um, probably just stick with the, uh, the bird. Um, I thought I would just move right along into doing the little demo portion here. Um, yeah, oh dear, that's bad form, my phone. <laughs> oh my god, as soon as I go live, my nose just gets so itchy. This has happened every time. I'm just like, how am I right? Why? Why? Ah, oh. oh, it's like, I was like painfully itchy too. Okay, do I what? Do I, do I holiday hoobie woody? Okay. No, I'm fine. I'm totally good. I'm totally cool. I have all of my poop in a group. So yeah, we're just going to transition right over to my little page here. Um, what I want to go over with this bird in particular is actually a little uh, less to do with the form rendering. Can you turn that off, please? I thought I did. Good gosh. Good lord. Um, a little less to do with the form rendering, like we've been uh, focusing on them the last couple streams. I've been going over these like basic shapes and then trying to connect them into the form of an animal. So again, the snowman technique with the bee, the sort of long um, ovular shape with the whale. And um, I think we've pretty much, we've hammered that in quite a lot on this particular stream. So with this, I want to focus on just kind of a, a cheat, I guess. Just the, the ball and string or the balloon method. Um, this is a really quick and easy way of building form and it works especially well with birds. Um, you have a circle, then you draw a little line down from that circle in any direction, really. Try and make it a bit of an S-curve and we're going to draw a ball around that line. So this is the sort of center mass of your bird. This ball drawn around that center mass. Uh, I wanted to make this a little more of an egg here because they have very, very prominent chests. But this is the body. And you have your couple legs coming off here. And you basically have a complete silhouette of a bird. This is kind of a way of cheating that form building. And the nice thing that we can do is if you have the circle, Let's draw the S curve this way. Now we can draw our little egg shape. And this S curve with this egg shape actually gave this guy like a lot of character. It looks like his head's pointing this way. So I'm gonna throw a beak in there, give his wings. And he looks kind of, I, I think this, he looks particularly like a Robin with his chest all puffed out. So it was pretty, pretty quick way of building this guy because what I want to focus on tonight is actually color relationships and we'll do that in the painting section. Um, the robins are wonderful for practicing um, adding colors and that's something I need a lot of practice with um, and specifically in limiting my palette. I think I've brought that up a couple times on stream as well. He's using fewer colors, uh, fewer pigments, in each of my paintings so that I can decrease the sort of um, color noise or visual noise that's going on and um, use that as sort of an insurance policy against my paintings getting muddied by overpainting and noodling, which is what I am notorious for. So um, these are just a couple examples of the sort of diversity of robins that you can find. Um, I don't know, I feel like robins have a lot of character like they're, I don't see fat and skinny sparrows, but I see like fat and skinny robins and specifically like really haggard looking ones. Um, and that kind of leads me into the next section here, which is my big reveal that I actually prepared for the stream this evening. Um, and it's this guy. Now, this is a robin that we saw on a walk actually a few 
few days ago and he was like super badass he had one leg and he was standing on this like fence post and just like staring at us and he got like a few feathers missing on his head and stuff he just looked like a real baller to your robin so i wanted to uh paint him and then on the other side here i have a pencil sketch started i want to do like a really really fat uh, robin in a nest so she's going to be sitting in a nest and we'll have some flowers and stuff around here but i'm going to focus on this guy for now and um just try and get the uh the painting underway here just kick it off so hello rivka hey rivka are you you're painting with us tonight that is wonderful i am very excited The delay is four seconds tonight. Ooh, our internet is not only doing better, but it's like fresh with a pH. That's wonderful. Maybe they were. Okay. So my color choices for this evening, I'm gonna grab a couple half pans from my, my wee palette here. Um, I'm gonna go bright with my orange. Um, these, these paints have a name, but, uh, I didn't write them down. So, uh, um, rest assured my next palette, when I'm through this one, will have their names written down. <laughs> oh my God. That's awful that I did that. Oh. Thank I, you. I just don't, I don't know this. I know it's a whole bind color cause it's got like, it's got that sheen to it. And Holbein uses, it's almost gouache, basically. It's a very, very dense watercolor. And the Windsor & Newton looks kind of like a little more grainy. But I don't know which Holbein color that is. Silly boy. Silly boy. Uh, I need to put that on my towel. I need my towel. It's so close. Okay. So, the main focuses for this Robin are going to be the red chest obviously but specifically the um downy texture on that red chest uh they're very fluffy there and then contrasting that hopefully that soft transition from those downy feathers into the sort of uh, more rigid um flight feathers and the like the lovely little silhouette that this guy has here I've, i tried to like He's almost, he's a little cartoony. I kind of put his head back. He looks like he's a race Robin. Like he's a real, he's a real badass. So, um, my color of choice for the, the gray that we're going for is actually going to be a combination of an ultramarine blue and a brown. Um, it's kind of a burnt umber. I think this is actually burnt umber. So there's my three colors for now, and I'm going to try and get as far as I can with just those to limit myself. Might throw in for the beak and stuff and around the eye this yellow, but we're going to put that over there. So this, and then maybe a little bit of that. Sounds good. Um, now, if you're just like drawing tonight and not painting, then just focus on... Uh, Focus on that balloon technique. See, like, if you have a couple pieces of paper in front of you, try and draw, like, four or five of them um, using a different balloon and string each time and see what you come up with. Um, maybe some of them won't work. That's totally cool. Um, oh, I thought we could do um, some sort of, like, a little giveaway or something with this guy. Oh, we'll probably post it on Instagram, but I did this little painting as a promo for the stream tonight. Um, I, guess, I don't know what we could do. I just, I thought of that when I made him, but Brianna, Brianna's the marketing wizard here. So we're gonna. So what I'm doing here is a little prelay of water in the chest area.
and then that will be nice to keep the edge transition soft um because what i don't want is watercolor going to the edge here and making a hard hard edge that i have to like scrub out to put these wings over and i want the wings to have the hard edges so let's see how this works i'm going to take this orange this unnamed holbein pigment and drop it on the most raised portions of the 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 bird's breast here which um is gonna kind of like humans is gonna be in the like pec pectoral area so we have the highest contrast on each one of these and then we're gonna just use that use that already wet surface and brush it down the already wet surface and brush it down because the surface is super wet <laughs> oh lord brianna's uh trying to silently eat her her uh <laughs> supper next to me here it's like uh kind of a squelchy tomato cheese and egg based sandwich um she can't hear herself so that's that's the important part rivka says i'm actually going for a bike ride but i'm gonna listen oh there is a running factor i have many there is yes brianna did the homework today it may have been in the last 15 minutes but she did it by god well done dear i did my master's degree in the last 15 minutes brianna did her master's degree in the last 15 minutes it's a it's a well-known fact i love that on her tombstone Tim Stone will read Brianna Gray, loving wife. Did you know I have a master's degree? Hey. I did it in the last 15 minutes. Mine will say Devin loving husband conspicuously without a master's degree. That's what mine's going to say. So which is worse? Okay, so as, a, as an initial wash, that might be a little too strong, but see how much color we got just by putting that in this area. And then we, we can control the sort of gradient density from the points where we put the water down, which is kind of cool. Let's do that with added. I don't know. bird and I have to make sure it's not like an owl. Ooh, maybe just a fat robin. Oh, it's a huge pigeon. A massive pigeon. It's huge. Sometimes they're outside our window. Like, we have to sleep with the window open here. Oh my god, he's looking at me. Because it's very warm now in Canada. It's looking at Brianna. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's gazing at her. How big would you say? Like chicken size. Like a chicken size. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought it was an owl. Thought there is a prairie pigeon. <laughs> They get damn near chicken size. <laughs> Some people think they actually are chickens. <laughs> They're bred with chickens in the long past. Holy. Smoke size, seen one the size of a rooster once. My sister didn't believe me. Look at that. That's nice. It's a nice little. He's so proud. He is. He's regal. Yeah. So I'm going to let this dry because what I want to do is I want to texture over this. I want to go in with, um, again, that like put in put in soft lines to indicate the, the downy texture and then um, blend those out. But to do that, I need to work on dry paper. I actually thought maybe I could put a little bit of this yellow in at the top of the, the breast as well. You can kind of see in the reference image here. What I'm trying to do is use the reference image as a guide and not like copy it. Um, but you go ahead and copy that thing because it'll be, it'll be easier to try and follow along with the actual image. Whereas I've just like turned his form a little bit. Um, 
just so I get more of that this pompous chest here. So I thought I'd put some yellow. Um, I want to think my my light source is coming from this direction, um, kind of like it is in the reference image as well. So still keeping the influence of it there, and put it on sort of the upper rounded side of these forms here. Kind of like a big heart. So cute. Parents are watching from the lake. Hello, parents watching from the lake. <laughs> wow, the internet can handle it out there, eh? That's great. Any trees down? I miss the sauna by inches. Um, I have to remember to keep this white. <laughs> I uh, didn't, well, I actually did that on this one. There's one part in this one, right? Oh yeah, this this kind of bottom area here. So their white blazes around the eyes are pretty consistent, but on their tummies here, they can change quite a lot depending on region. I learned from Google. That's the thing I learned from Google. Um, now, what do I want to go for? I'll let this dry, but I want to be very, very cautious of this edge here. So I might actually start by blending that out a little bit so that it doesn't get too hard edged. Brianna, she's being really, really good about eating this sandwich. I see she's like hunching up and like. <laughs> I can hear each square centimeter of tomato being crushed. By the all devouring jaws. Here we go. So I'm going to take my ultramarine blue. Um, risky business here. It's a risky business because I want to achieve this gray color, but I don't really want to premix my color. I want to try and mix it on the canvas. So we'll see. How this goes. Um, ooh. I'm going to do the same thing where I put an initial wash of water down first uh, within the edges that I've defined here. Um, I dipped my paintbrush in the paint and then rinsed it off but as you there's a little bit of a blue tint still in this water which is helpful to actually see where it's going down. Um, Obviously, if I was doing this in a place where I didn't want blue, like I maybe wanted this red, uh, that would be bad because this, this, even this soft pigment will influence whatever goes over top of it. Um, so you have to be very conscious about washing your brushes. I normally use two things of water, one to like wash it and the other one to rinse it basically and get it saturated. That keeps the water clean too in one of the jars. So here we are. Oh, this is cool. This uh, orange color is actually getting brushed out into this blue and it's kind of making almost a purple. That's really cool. It's very light though. I'm not sure. Does it read at all on Streamlit? Cool. Look at that. It's nice. So, uh, that was a lot of blue. We'll see what happens here. want this to be our lit side, so I'm gonna brush this blue more into the center of the form. Um, I kind of want this blue to transition from the color of his, the color of his plumage to sort of the light that's reflecting on the top of his head. Um, not really direct sunlight, I'm kind of thinking 
It's sort of a diffused daylight blue there on the top. So if the audience had like a zap button, I would say zap me if I accidentally just like mindlessly put pigment up here on his forehead. And that's where the audience zap button comes in. Because we can't use the zap collar that Brianna has for me in this scene. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like a He's a creamsicle. Actually, more like a peach bellini. Ooh. Oh, we're getting into peach bellini season. Too bad there are no patios. Hey, the patio is the, the ground you make the patio. Insightful. <laughs> Thank you. That's why they call me Sunzu. <laughs> No patio survives first contact with the. With the I was trying to make it a Sun Tzu reference. Oh, it's, it's reaching. I'm reaching. Um, how to tell if you're ADD? Someone is painting next to you, but it's way better on the screen. Okay. I'm just, I'm just roasting it. Ah, it's true. That was that was an uncalled for roast. But in these in these trying times, one has to keep up to date on their ability to roast, because when uh, when the floodgates open and humanity returns, as it were, um, I don't want to be caught with an unhoned roast stone roast. I can just can't talk and paint. Here we go. Oh, that's cool. It's it's blending into this beautiful, beautiful orange. It's like purple. Um, looks kind of like the wings are folding back actually under the tail here so I guess this behind his leg here would be the underside of the wing and back here as well again I kind of want to keep my values on this side lighter except for where that wing volume turns so this like this is a little trick here what are we seeing here are we seeing the outside of the wing or the inside of the wing because i haven't really defined it that well um i'd say we're saying we're seeing the outside of the wing to about this line right here this sort of invisible line that i've marked and then to the right of that would actually be the concave inside of that feather like kind of folding this way um so we're seeing how do i orient this to the camera we're seeing the feather like this uh so i could make this inside dark to show kind of his his round shape there um i do need to wait for that to dry though so because that requires a hard edge that would go from a lit side to a shaded side from the viewing angle like very quickly so I also want to do that around this area because this is his little stump. He's well, again, he's our one-legged robin. Um and because that's like a that's a strong sort of character feature of this painting that a viewer wouldn't expect, right? Like you don't expect the robin to be one-legged. I want to frame that one leg in the dark shadow of the underside of the wing so that it stands out and becomes kind of a prominent detail. Um, because eyes on these creatures, like eyes on basically any animal, pull so much focus that even when this is outlined, it will still, in comparison to a face and an eye, come across as kind of a minor detail. 
Um, so I have to put a little bit of work and thought into strengthening that detail. And down to here is going to be kind of blue, but I don't really want to put that in quite yet. I want to preserve this to make sure that I can really work with it and maybe preserve a highlight along this rim here. So that's our bird more or less blocked in. Um, I think I have to make the, the same decision on this side, whether we're seeing the outside or the inside of the wing. So I would, I think I might make just all of this the inside because we're kind of looking at a bit of a bit of an off angle towards him. But here it's gonna wrap around and we're gonna see sort of the body feathers like around his shoulder like on the reference image there. Just kind of, because it's not the best reference image because he's rather in shadow, isn't he? Well. Okay, this. You want to feel your paper and sometimes even your canvas with uh, the back of your hand because you produce uh, Oh, is this, is this a less or fewer? Fewer oils. You produce fewer oils off of your knuckles than you do off of your fingertip. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't know that that was a thing you did. Oh, it is a thing I do. And you can, you can kind of tell, like, uh, there's a couple um, off clippings of paper I've been trying to, like, paint, uh, like, bookmarks on my clippings because I hate wasting this like really beautiful paper and because they're they're off cuts I've clearly handled them a lot now, this is really gross but if you like put a wash on it if you put a flat wash of uh, color across the whole thing you can actually find your fingerprint really? yeah it's gross and I'm like these are my hands I'm about that clammy expose my hands Forensic scientist and artist, Devin O'Kander. Brianna's the actual forensic scientist. I'm not a forensic. Yeah, but you went through a hardcore forensic science phase. I went through a murder mystery podcast phase. <laughs> With you and your phases, there are no half measures. No. So, I mean... I know that you researched forensic science a lot when you were in that phase. That basically makes you a forensic scientist. I am a scientist. That's good enough. Okay, you could you could Mrs. Marple the shit out of like any scandal that happened around here. I bet you could. <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> Little Agatha Christie reference in there. <laughs> you yes. So I'm going to paint this underside in here, and we have to transition to our segment. So I'll just try and push some of this blue up into the underside of these body feathers now and start trying to texture in there a little bit and I'm trying to keep the only put the paint on the underside of the feather because there's light shining down on that feather and casting a shadow on what's beneath it here but because watercolor I kind of got it smudging together a little bit here but that's okay because the, out here can be the feather, and we can define that when we put in the background. Just 
quick. Um, now over this still wet blue, sorry, wet blue, I'm going to take some of this brown, and this is the scary bit, so I'm going to start in the shaded areas. Um, and we're going to try and mix this into the ultramarine for a lovely gray effect. And that will hopefully make our shadows look really interesting. This might be too much of a yellow brown because we're kind of mixing into a green here. Ooh, not if we combine them enough, but that's making our shadow color here like very cool looking. So if you've ever been in, our, in an art class, you've probably had an art teacher tell you not to use like pure black or pure white. Um, because those are flat tones. Uh, and when you're painting, I think that is quite true if you're trying to go for a lot of color pop and visual interest, especially using a limited palette, right? You want to mix the colors um, and try not to get muddy, but you want to have like a little bit of this Right, this green coming through, this green that we don't have a green on our palette, but there's green now coming through in the image, simply because apparently yellow is a big component of that brown that I used. So when you mix it together, that really starts to show up. Um, and interesting darks make for just brighter brights if that makes sense if you have visual interest in your shadow areas um, typically like very light highlights are hard to pigment um, especially in watercolor like you just want to leave the paper white basically so you kind of combat that flatness flatness that you get in that lit area with uh, visually interesting shadows, a lot of colors in your shadows. So that's kind of neat. We didn't quite get the gray I was picturing, but that's kind of a, a happy accident. See, we're trying to paint sort of this inside curve here and then lose that edge going up. And now it looks like he's turning. So this is the outside of the wing. This is the inside of the wing. And we could take a little more brown and just kind of run that along this edge down here. Now that's a little bit too strong an edge, but let's take some water and we'll brush that into the shadow a little more here. Nice. And then this will transition to the rounded form of his chimkin leg here. He's not cute. He's a badass. Look, he has one leg. Yeah. Remember we saw him and then we just kind of stood there being intimidated for like five minutes being like, does he have one leg? Because he was quite far away actually. I thought he was used to mingling, but yeah. he, he, was he was just stumpy. Yeah. Mm. That's gorgeous, babe. Yeah? Yeah. I love it. Pink. 
yeah this actually blended a lot more um the paper that i'm using like i'm not used to paper this nice it's uh arches <laughs> um i basically got it i got it gifted and it's so nice it t it like keeps water in its fibers so much longer than uh the sort of like i guess the student grade or the hobbyist grade paper that i was using before and it's incredible but it does change like i have to change how i paint a little bit um because the paint really is going into the paper instead of just sort of pooling on top now so it, it made, it's like my drying times are wonky but god it's so so pretty like this blue it kind of shaded this for me here um to the point where i'm not even sure i want to go and like put too much of this texture on it like that this looks cool enough so i might texture this side a little more because it's lit right it'll be lit um, this is in shadow so i can actually use the texture as my shading so going from light to dark what you can do is add a little bit of texture here where it's overexposed and then in this area is where i'm going to want the most the most visible plumage right standing on one leg He's been nailed to the perch. Oh no, he's falling. He's just resting. Pining for the fjord. Okay. I'm gonna define his little leg here because it's in, it's important to see um tried to make him look like he's kind of at an off angle like really taking all of his weight on one leg um because typically a bird would stand with their leg sort of out almost at a what would that be almost at a 45 degree angle to their um, quadricep here and then you have two of those anchor points but this guy he was kind of just like that's what made us kind of stop and look at him because he was holding his weight differently because well, Brianna is just like animal empath extraordinaire she's like, is he okay is he limping and you know she's not limping she's got no bloody leg this is super cool. You just had to make sure. I just had to make sure. Brianna saves bees. It's very important. If we're ever walking and there's a bee, that's sad. She will save the bee. She's in an important part ecosystem. Yeah, we've touched the bees, yo. They are. You're the, you taught me that, though, that the bees literally fly until they don't have enough cellular energy to keep their wings going like they work that hard yeah. and then they will just sort of fall out of the sky and if you see a bee on the ground it's probably not dead it's probably just <laughs> almost exhausted to death so if you pick him up put him on the sidewalk you saved a bee you may have saved a hive and then you save the local ecosystem the early bees are the most important the early bees Hmm. So don't cut your dandelions until there are crocuses or something, okay? The first wave of bees is like the infantry going towards the tanks, man. Yeah. Hmm. Dandelions are important. Mm -hmm. So don't let don't let the judgment of your neighbor get to you. Just keep them until Judge them you back. Care other flowers. Then for, you can take down the dandelions. But. Yeah. Judge them back for killing bees. Alright, I'm going to have to let this guy dry a little bit before I do anything more to him. So, I think we should transition into the uh, 
into the Moose's Science Minute here. And here we go. Here's the... There we are. We're in the lab. And now it's time. Educate yourselves. Wasn't as smooth as I thought it would be, but you're the coolest science teacher ever. All right. Uh -oh. I I thought there can't be that many interesting facts about robins, but I was wrong, and I should have learned that in all my years. <laughs> but uh, I learned a lot of things about them. First of all, their genus name is Turdus, which is hilarious. Um. They come from the Turdidae family, which include Turdidae, which has like uh, finches and warblers, that kind of thing. Hmm. Wrens. Wrens. Mm -hmm. Quails? No. No, not quails. Not quails. Okay. Um, they are not actually related to Britain's robin, um, or not closely anyway, but settlers when they arrived here thought that they looked kind of similar because they both have red um chests and faces so they called it the robin breasts yeah. they both have red breasts mm -hmm. um and they're well known for being the first sign of spring but they do actually winter here or huge or ish hmm. they just sleep a lot i think excuse me um oh here's some facts um, the males and females actually look pretty much the same. Uh, the females, if you look really hard, are slightly less bright. Um, but other than that, they are not very sexually dimorphic, <laughs> which just means when you can very clearly tell apart the male and a female of a species. So if you think of like mallard ducks, you definitely know which one is male and which one is female. But if you think of um, like gophers, not so much. Um, they're omnivores, they eat bugs, berries, grass, whatever, um, but they also enjoy fermented berries, seemingly on purpose, like a, a, a what do you call a flock of robins? Um, a, a, a theft, a theft of a robins. A theft of yes, robins? Yes, they're robin, <laughs> they're robin together. Uh, uh, you call them a, a group. I, it could just be a flock. A flock. Um they will like pick out a bush that has berries that have fallen down and half rotted and they'll all eat a bunch of them to the point that they like fall over so they get drunk on purpose which makes them cooler than i thought they were um they also have like really <laughs> drunk makes them cool that's so sick it makes them very intelligent oh they go to the pub yeah they go to the pub yeah that's great i love it um they have a r amazing hearing and eyesight which is why they startle like before you even realize the bird is there sometimes if you scare it out of a bush um these are my three most interesting facts first of all um they're really good singers we know this you can hear them all the time it's one of the first songs of spring and they are one of the birds in the canadian dawn chorus which i just learned about but there's like five birds that sing this what you hear in the morning basically um and they have not a larynx because that's a mammalian thing but a syrinx and it is extremely specialized and variable like they have a wide range of notes because of their vocal cords um and they can sing like for hours and hours cool yeah that's really cool um so yeah that's one of their most highly developed traits and then when it comes to their eggs, we all know Robin's egg blue. It never occurred to me to ask why <laughs> it was that color, but it is because it's because of proteins in the mother's blood. So when we reproduce, um, the lining of the human uterus is made of mostly tissue that the body has decided can be Put to better use elsewhere it's kind of the where the rubbish gets swept out more or less and that will sort of become the placenta that's not quite exact but close enough um and same with birds the egg shells are made out of their 
blood and their excess tissues. So pigments that are in their blood that come from hemoglobin and bile happen to reflect that color of light. So that's just the particular chemistry of Robin's blood makes their eggs blue. That's so cool. So cool. <laughs> they don't need a special diet to make them blue. Like they'll always be blue. That's just what, that's just what color their eggs are because of their blood. So cool. <laughs> And then the males and the females will raise the chicks together while they're in the nest. And it only takes two weeks for them to fledge. So I've been seeing smaller robins and thinking like, oh, it's too early for them to be out. But probably not, actually. Um, the Yeah, both the mom and the dad will take care of them for two to three weeks. And then they'll watch over them for another couple of weeks while they learn to fly around. And then that's it. you got one month and you have a full-fledged robins cool yeah that's the science minute that's the science minute so next time you see a robin you can be like yo why is your blood blue cool well their blood's not blue but oh. next time you see a robin you can be like excuse me sir are you drinking <laughs> are you old enough to be drinking <laughs> are you over a month old you can't drink if you're under if you're under a month old oh that's my voice Oh, yeah. This chair is too heavy to do the sexy spinner. Oh, come on. You can do the sexy spinner now. Yeah. Get yeah. your climbing arms. Look at that forearm. Oh, no. No, that actually that actually did torque my wrist a little bit. It's oh, pretty heavy. <laughs> amateur. Amateur. Oh, amateur here as well. I need to go back <laughs> to the... Whoa. <laughs> That's a Okay, we have this stupid joke in our house where you cough every time you open a can just to hide the sound of the can opening because we drink like far too much far too much pop <laughs> and uh it just scares me every time she does it oh i have to transition the scene back there we go hey that's what i'm gonna well done okay so can we feel with a knuckle pretty damp um but i think we could work around in this area wait for this to dry a bit because again we want to preserve these hard edges um i could i could block in the stump as well and i don't mean his foot i mean the wood that he's standing on oh, <laughs> oh. Um, something that I also wanted to try in this painting, uh, this will probably be off stream, but I want to try and have the background look out of focus. And a good way of doing that is making everything that is in focus look very sharp. So. I don't really want to go over these lines too much, and I want to take some extra pigment, kind of throw them, or throw it rather, in here. And because I put a little bit of water down, or even a little bit of wet pigment, and I just sort of like push the pigment saturated water into that edge, hopefully that'll make a really nice crisp crisp edge I want to soften that up a bit I want too many edges on the interior of your form that's where we can oh no no tiktok oh my god on the interior of your uh, of your wooden post so here's another way of doing what I did on the other side this is starting with the dark and then we take a little bit of water in our brush and we feather that in but here's a little indication of the issue with doing that if you're not quite fast enough is this edge is a little persistent it's kind of cool actually it looks a little like wood grain so i mean that's so much of watercolor painting is being like i should try this Oh crap, it's terrible. And you're like, okay, it's not that terrible. It added a cool effect. 
and you do something later and you're like, oh, now it's all time. Uh, there we go. Now I want to paint the top plane of the post. Oh, that looks kind of cool. Looks like there's a bit of a, maybe it's a rotting post. It's an old fence post or something, so it's kind of giving way. So we probably want to take this and do the pre the pre wetting between his his dino peats here. Because he's an actual philosopher. This guy really looked like he was related to a Velociraptor way back. Or at least like he fought one off. And this is a Velociraptor. It's not that hard. You have the stegosaurus, stegosaurus the T-Rex, and the velociraptor. That's the velociraptor. Okay. There. And a little more of that wood grain. It looks kind of cool. Um, let's take a little bit of yellow. Just put that in a couple choice areas here. Mm. Oh, scoot it up a little bit. Oh, I'm already right on my, uh, right on the computer. Here, I'll just quickly finish this and then go back to the, yeah, oh, okay, okay. I didn't really plan it that well when I stretched this paper on this board. Oh, that's all right. The bird's the important bit. And then when this is dry, I'm going to put the bird, like his drop shadow, on this stump, like around. Where's our light coming from? Where would it clip him? Like from here. Down. Cool. So this is the this is the paint level that I kind of want to get to more frequently, and it's it's proving to be much easier if I do the do the underdrawing first as opposed to just kind of winging it like I did last time. Um, I'm gonna put his beak in now and start with very light yellow. I'm actually kind of dry brushing this in. The paint, the brush is not very full of paint right now. And I don't really want to take it all the way up here because the tips of their beaks are typically like, um, like a dark brown, but they're also quite reflective. So I have a little bit of an issue here. I'm not sure what put the reflection back kind of in the yellow area, it might get lost a bit, or I could put the reflection right in the dark bit. Um, but I want to leave this white so I have the option whenever I decide later. This, a little bit of coloration around that area just for fun. Now, to get that kind of russety color. I'm going to take a very small amount of my orange. Whoa. It's not quite small enough. Like so little paint goes so far here. Oh, 
Oh. That shows up on stream okay? The underside of his beak here. And then make this a bit stronger because there's going to be a little bit of brown going that, going over that orange later. So we have a little bit of a streak that goes out into the beak. I actually might want to pull some paint here. So that's a, a way of, if you feel that something's kind of getting out of hand, getting a little saturated a little quickly, you just dry your brush off and actually like suck that, uh, that pigment rich water just like right off the page before it can sink in. So it is a time sensitive activity and if you're using acrylics or something like that, obviously you can just paint over it. Um, no such luck for us watercolory people. Some watercolors, I think they it's like we deserve to be recognized for the level we have to think about each stroke we make. Just Um, let's see here. Okay, okay, yeah, this is drier now. So, here's the scary part. Um, this I might actually bring in a palette for so that I can control my pigment a lot because I don't want to lose this really cool uh, happy accident the watercolor made there. Um, where it's kind of shading the bird's breast for me. But I still want to get that, that texture in there because I've been, been practicing that this week. Um, I'm working on some texturing. So I wanted to apply it. But like I said, we can use the texture to show the roundness of the form. Um, in this area. So if we're looking up at this is my this is my hand, sort of in the the kind of conical, I guess. And we're looking up at it, which way does the contour go? Kind of goes there. Kind of like up like that. You know? So I want to try and paint that. I want to try and paint this, his feathers coming out in this direction. Because if I painted it looping down here, going like that, on this top bit, it would make this look flat. So we're going from looking at the top of the chest here to the bottom of the chest here. So this is a bit of a confusing form change, actually. You have lines going like this way. Right, and then you're going to have a somewhat straight line, kind of where your horizon line is. And then from there on, we're going to dip down. Um, makes it even more difficult because the feathers all have this uh, shape to them, the like crescent shape. So let's see if we can do this. Go. Put, so there's going to be another layer in here, but space them out a bit first. And then what we want to do, and this is going to be very light, it's almost like a practice layer. But we brush that down. Here we have 
have a bit of that lovely plumage. <laughs> oh no, he's got nice plumage. That's the sales guy. Yeah, you're right. Oh, it's lovely plumage. He's a bit dead. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. A minor detail. <laughs> Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. So that's very subtle. Um, I kind of want to keep it at that subtle level here and then darken up this area, get this a little more contrasty because we're going into that shadowed area as this as his breast turns in here away from our light source. We want to make it darker. And as we were talking about earlier with the making darks interesting, you can do that with color. You can also do it with texture. Um, something I want to practice is using texture to shade more as opposed to shading on top of texture, uh, which just makes art in my opinion, well, especially my art, a little more visually confusing. Um, there's just so much going on there. So if you can simplify your visual communication by rendering your texture as your shade, I think you will have a more coherent image, something that you can kind of take in at one glance that isn't isn't muddier. That's the logic anyways. Um, it's this weird balance of less is more, but for highly detailed, highly rendered, like photorealistic artwork, it's like finding that balance is really, really difficult. And that's obviously not what we're going for here, but the work up to something like that. We want hints of realism here. But, you know, I, I kind of want to keep, I want to keep his coloring on more of the blue side. Just because I think it's really pretty. <laughs> um, as opposed to going to that, like, that blue-gray that a, uh, Robin actually has, but um, I think one confusing aspect might be this little tuft he's got here, kind of reading as almost like a J. So I might want to make him more Robin colored like around this area to counteract that. I just like this little tuft. He looks like a speed racer, so I want to keep it. <laughs> Here's the lovely part about this paper. Let's look at that in that texturing that I did. I can just use the water that's already there to increase the contrast because this is dry and this is wet now. Oh, I haven't been able to do that before with other papers. So I have to be careful here. If we cut in a little bit, like do some stuff like that. I was worried about them looking too much like scales. So if we give a little bit of that feather break there, where the fibers of the feather are like sticking to one another, or splitting apart, I think that makes it look a little more feathery. I just looked up for the first time in like 10 seconds. Like yeah, it's a nice quick way of doing it. Um, we kind of got a little homogenized in here, so we want to just let it dry. And I kept it light enough that it's not going to be a problem to go over and put a little more texture in there. And then 
down here, this is the problem that this created. It's like this is now lighter than this and it shouldn't be. So what do we do? Do I brush this in and just try and preserve those edges? I think so. So maybe the edges of these feathers are like puffed out a little bit and they're catching the, catching a bit more light, which it does happen, especially because we're going from this like upward curve form change to a lower curve. When you see that in animals, like look at your dog around their neck, we have a lot of articulation. There's a lot of sort of like spacing in the hair. There's like columns of hair almost. Um, just like on your wrist, you have these like the wrinkles on your wrist that form. If you were hairy, they'd be growing out of the high part, not of the low part. It's kind of gross to think of your wrists as having hair spreading out of them, but um, that's where you render that hair. Well, that's where you can see it most clearly on animals as well is in those sort of junction points or when a form curves um, most aggressively. So hopefully actually having those little edges kind of helps sell that idea. We'll see. getting really subtle up in here because I don't want to mess with this. It's too cool to mess with. Then I could definitely take some of this still wet paint here, sort of brush that into a texture as well. Oh, it's lovely plumage. Cool. Yeah, maybe getting a little scaly here, so I can throw some some lines back towards where the where the feather would be growing from. Here's another way maybe we could sell the uh, the curve. Taking a little bit of yellow, it's a dangerous color to use a lot of, and there's a lot of it on my brush right now. Just sort of brush that into these upper feathers here. So even if this pigment is in terms of actual value, like not lighter. Because with watercolor, if we're adding paint on top of paint, we're probably darkening the value. Um, but what I'm relying on is having the visual association here of having this, this is yellow here, and it's at the top facing the light source. So brain says yellow is light. So if I put yellow here, even though it's technically darker, even than this bottom spot now, your brain might say yellow light. So that's selling the idea. It's a bit of a cheat. But visual associate, uh, associations, visual associations like that are very important in artworks. Um, if you've ever seen the, I don't know, the like visual illusion graphs that like have arrows pointing at a lit cube, being like, which part of this is this side of the cube lighter or darker than this side? Surprise, they're both of the same value. And you're like, whoa, but that one looks so much lighter. It's because of these context cues. I hope, I hope those like Buzzfeed things are ubiquitous enough that people know what I mean. <laughs> it's like the color the the color equivalent of that picture where you like is it a lamp or a duck okay. whoa <laughs> that's beautiful oh my god is that in uh, pencil crayon i think so 
That's gorgeous. Damn, dude. Well done. That's beautiful. Okay. Um, so now that kind of careful texturing is done. So we wanted to make sure that stayed really light. And I think we can go a little bit darker and work a little bit faster now, kind of down here, but I don't want to get carried away. Sometimes I do. We're getting pretty dark down here now. Um, and these, so most of this will probably be blended together. But what I can do is put these thin lines down and sort of wait for that initial pigment to sort of sink into the paper. And then when I brush this all into sort of one mass, one shadow mass here, um, some of those lines might stay. If I even want to, let's see. It does look kind of cool, actually, having that like very, very saturated under tummy. What I could do to sell that actually is take a bit of this, the brown color that we have for the post, and mix that in just on the very bottom ones. So hopefully this brown color will mix with the orange in a slightly different way than it mixes with this blue. Obviously it will. It's mixing into orange, but we don't want it to get muddy here. This is a this is a mud danger zone. Because I've mixed this brown into orange and blue. So I have a cool brown, I have a warm brown, and if those mix together, then it's going to be kind of like a poop gray, which we don't want. Don't want that. But because these, now we have a warm value kind of up against this cool value, I think that could be really cool. Definitely shows up on stream better because it's hmm? thoughts okay. We're coming into to prime Netflix hour. Shouldn't affect our upload really that much. don't understand the internet. Cool. Legs big dude, that's why I died in Destiny. So we have to blend them on. It's a video game. So yeah, that's kind of coming together nicely. Um, there's a bit orange down here still, but I think we could uh, wait for that to dry actually. And then I'll just do like a nice little flat wash of that brown in there to kind of cut back on this orange because it's overpowering this area. And with that being said, I think we could work on now making this chest stand out more by darkening and somewhat neutralizing 
these blues. I'll have to darken them and then neutralize them. And uh, they will be neutralized. Um, I heard an interesting thing. Uh, a teacher said, if you draw or render every feather, you've made this visual acknowledgement with the viewer that every feather on this form exists, okay? So if I decided that I was getting bored of rendering these feathers and stopped rendering them, the viewer would say, okay, those feathers are missing, right? Whereas if I just go about suggesting feathers in certain places, so there's a suggestion of texture, there's a suggestion of texture here and here. Your brain, we've made, we've made a different pact. It's like, okay, the, the bird is covered in these feathers. I know this because I know what these birds look like. But simply because they're not rendered here doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, I'm just driving focus into different areas by rendering more or less. Um, and the whole like visual pact thing, like you've made an agreement with the viewer, I thought was a really interesting way of putting it. So in like in kids artwork, you see them render like, they meticulously render the scales of the fish like halfway down. And then it's just kind of like colored in for the rest. It's like that fish is not wearing pants. Whereas if you just kind of like do a couple scales, like groupings of scales down the whole thing, um, you spend a third of the time rendering and the whole fish to your brain is like, oh, it's covered in scales, it's a, it's a fish. It was really interesting. This is definitely a catch-22 if you're like, I'm gonna really, really detail this thing. And even here, now I could wash this all together a little bit. So you see these edges forming? I hope you can see this. It's like a little bit of brown now. I want to be really careful with this paint. Just kind of put it in there. And I'm not going to mix it around as much as I did down here. So we'll get that greeny brown. I want to dab it in. There we go. In my drawing, you've even given him like a little, like a little badass eye scar. Well, we'll see if we keep it. I think Brianna's voted yes for keeping it. It's ten to nine. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're still trying to figure out what to do with the, uh, like the format of the streams. We've um, finally got an understanding of all of the software and stuff that we're going to use to make videos and tutorials and stuff. So, um, so much of the startup process is us being like, oh, we're going to make these videos. And people are like, where are they? What are, what are you doing? 
are you making the videos? It's like, uh, we're, yeah, you say it and then you're like, I'm going to open DaVinci Resolve and just kind of stare at the editing software for hours. Be like, oh my God, this is incredibly daunting. But Days ago, I spent eight hours on that editing software and came away with no usable footage. Yeah. <laughs> Not any. So they can be, yeah, the first, the first like 10 or 15 hours of editing in these, in these like, kind of open source software davinci's not they're just like free to use now but oh god they can be excruciating so yeah we're just trying to like work out the kinks and stuff the uh the stream went live fine this evening which is really really nice uh we've had a couple issues with it in the last couple weeks here um but that seems to be running more smoothly now I decided to shade the inside of his stump here. I don't want this to get much darker though. Um, and I will still push this value to make this stand out a little more. And then make this a light brown, like a light brown as his local color. Um, local color refers to sort of the unlit natural color of the, the surface that you're rendering. Um, so cartoons basically are all local colors uh, unless they have obvious shading on them. It's kind of a neat, neat distinction. I'm gonna have to texture these feathers as well here. Brush that in, and with a wet brush, brush that out and down. Just kind of looking at the side of a feather here. I don't really know how to render the side of a feather. So you're just kind of looking at the ends of all of these bristles coming straight at you. So I thought maybe if I kind of stipple that in there, that might sell it. I'm just trying to work very three-dimensionally or think very three-dimensionally. Whether that translates to the work yet or not is yet to be seen, but definitely something I can feel it when I haven't drawn for a couple days just like really think about it uh -huh. maybe we can here we'll do the eye for everyone before we close out the stream here we'll get at least I'm going to use this dark brown for my under color of the eye here I'm going to do yeah lighter brown for his beaks um, what I might do is go back in with a very light highlight of like pure white gouache for his pupillary reflection. There we go. And uh, when he's all done, I will put him on Instagram. I hope this does serve to sort of illustrate the point I open the streamed with the stream with um, regarding just these like two color combinations right this has all been done with 
four paints. I did I did end up using the yellow like much more than I set out to at the start, but I think it's a it's a great color to incorporate. So um, using just these, we can get a range of cool effects and stuff like that and ensure that our image doesn't get too muddy. Um, and we have these lovely, like this balance of warm and cool, right? So we're gonna go around this whole thing, really, really showcase that thing that makes, a, I think, a robin the most unique, which is the red chest. Um, and now because this guy's our, he's our little warrior, we're uh, also basically throwing in a couple like interesting details that make this robin not really just a painting of a robin. Right, this guy's got character. Um, Why do you look sad? Yeah, that next to the gray, sort of. Let me do his dinosaur feet. Velociraptor paints. Jurassic toesies. Mostly Cretaceous toesies, yeah. <laughs> Damn it. I can't get that stuff past you. No, it's, 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 I love that joke. <laughs> Welcome to Mostly Cretaceous Park. Really? Yeah. Under the sea somewhere in the Pacific. Oh. There is more time between Stegosaurus and T Rex than there is between T Rex and us. Those fun facts, <laughs> those like those like deep time facts just destroy me. That that obliterates me. So I can't even conceive of it. it was, ew. Lord. Okay, guys, well, hopefully that gives you a good idea of where this is going and how we got there so far. Um, if you drew or painted along, thank you so, so very much for coming and hanging out. I know this is sort of a a poorly advertised stream, um, but you know, a successful one nonetheless. We have our stream up and running on time. I actually had my paints and water. It's huge. It's frankly huge. So cheers, everybody. Thanks for attending paint night. Um, if you think someone might like the, uh, the video version of this um, little tutorial, I guess, uh, just direct them towards the YouTube channel. Uh, and as always, like send, send pictures of your, of your Robins because I love, love seeing the stuff people do when they watch the stream. So um, here's until next time. Cheers, everybody. Uh, we're gonna slowly drifting into frame here. Ha! Okay, thanks guys. Thank you so much for coming along and saying hi. And you know, look out for this guy on the uh, on the old Instagram page. Okay, cheers everyone. See you.